Hello, everyone. Welcome to our Wednesday edition of the Orange Brown Talk podcast. I'm Dan Lobby with Mary Kay Cabot and Ashley Bastock. Lance Riceland is going to come up uh, in the second part of this podcast to look back on the Browns' win uh, the other day in Washington. I do want to start this podcast off uh, a little bit, spend a little bit of time on the DeMar Hamlin situation. Um, everyone, of course, has seen or, or heard about it to this point. Um, so I'm, I'm not going to recap uh, the, the entire situation, but our last update as we're recording this, it's about 3.30 on Tuesday, is that he remains hospitalized in critical condition. Um, that was the last update that we got from his family and, and from the Bills. Um, certainly a, a chilling moment, a, a disturbing moment, Mary Kay. There's, I mean, there's not a lot to really say about it other than you know, we're certainly hoping for the best and, and praying for the best for DeMar, but, but just one of those moments that it, it kind of, you know, we cover football and it, it kind of puts this all in perspective, I, I think. Yeah, you know, I've never seen anything like it. I have never seen anything like that in all my years of covering the NFL, 30 some years. Never, I've never seen anything like that. And I'm still completely upset and rattled about it uh, all day today, just worried about him worrying about his mom, his younger brother. I read Tyler Dunn's amazing feature story from last year, uh, all about Damar Hamlin. It's so good if you get a chance to read that. Um, And it just makes you even really feel for him and his family even more. Uh, It's, um, it's just so tragic and so sad, but I think the, you know, the thing that I'm amazed about is that they were able to get to him and restart that heart. I mean, my goodness, uh, to be able to at least give him a chance to remain alive. It's it's almost mind blowing. I can't even believe uh, that, you know, that they were able to do that and that he, you know, that he still is in ICU, in critical care right now, fighting for his life. And he is doing that because those medical professionals uh, did a tremendous job on the field. But, um, you know, I think the NFL has done the right thing by postponing the game indefinitely. Nobody wants to think about playing that game again yet. No players from either side uh, are ready for that yet. So who knows how it's going to play out. And I don't think anybody really cares about that right now. All anybody cares about is what they should care about. And that is the well-being of DeMar Hamlin. So, you know, prayers up from all of us, I know. And uh, let's just hope that he pulls through this. And and Ashley, I think kind of one of the takeaways watching all of this was just the outpouring of support. And, um, you know, you don't see it a lot (laughs) now on on social media and um, in in the world we live in. But, you know, all the NFL teams have changed their profile pictures to, uh, to his number and his jersey. Uh, we've, we've seen the, the donations to his toy drive. I think the last I saw it was over $3 million, uh, donated to his toy drive. Just that out over 4 million now, Mary Kay tells me. So it, it continues to go up just that, that outpouring of support, um, and everyone just kind of coming together and being human beings in, in all of this. Yeah. I think it's really rare that you get a moment like this and, you know, I think for, a lot of times, like when people talk about any athlete, like not just NFL players, but any professional athlete, like they get talked about like their stats or a number on a jersey or a roster spot. Um, but I think this really kind of underscores that these guys are people. And I think a lot of what we do in telling their stories is to remind people of that. But I think a moment like this just kind of transcends everything. I mean, everyone came into that game yesterday expecting, and I think Lisa Salter said it on the ESPN broadcast that, you know, they were expecting this to be the game of the year, Um, not just on Monday Night Football, but possibly the game of the year, given all the playoff seating implications and how quickly it turned to none of this even matters. I mean, it was just stunning to watch in real time. Um, And yeah, like Mary Kay said, I mean, it's, it's hard to think about anything else, even for me, like today, Um, besides how he's doing and what this must have been like for those players and his family. And I think it just hits home for players across the league because, I mean, it's just stunning and traumatizing to have to see something like that and see another young player go through something like that. Yeah, and and certainly I think for a lot of fans, um, 
who maybe spent all last night scrolling Twitter or spent all of today scrolling Twitter, there is sort of a feeling of like, well, what what are we supposed to do? And I mentioned the I mentioned the GoFundMe for his toy drive. I mean, if if you're looking for something, that's you know, you can go make a small donation. I'll put a link to that um, in the uh, the description of the podcast, or you know, you can find it pretty much anywhere on social media too. Um, that's that's a good way if you're looking for something to do, um, something to kind of make yourself feel positive in this situation. Uh, that's that's certainly something that uh, that you can do. So we would encourage that. Um, okay, it feels a little weird to transition to football, I think, but we're going to for a minute because I don't know. Maybe people could use the distraction. So let, let's turn the page to this week and kind of set up the week and kind of what you guys are looking for this week as we head into week 18, the final week of the season, which um, as of now, no changes to the schedule, but this is a, a very fluid situation. Uh, Mary-, Mary Kay, what's something you're kind of keeping an eye on this this week? Well, first of all, I, I do think that um, that this situation is going to be weighing on the minds of everybody as they head back onto the football field. I mean, there's no way that as a player and as the mother of a player or the wife of a player that you're not going to have this on your mind, that you're not going to be worried about it. So I think that's one thing. I mean, we were looking at this game in Pittsburgh and the intensity of it. And, you know, maybe things will be different by the time we get to the game. Maybe we will have gotten some good news about uh, DeMar Hamlin by then, hopefully. Um, But I do think that it's going to spill over into the weekend's games and um, and have some kind of an impact on the players, because, you know, there's going to be, uh, you know, some kind of a, you know, probably like a tribute or or some kind of a moment or something. Um, And even if not, there will be a reminder uh, to everyone uh, that, you know, they have to go back out there. Uh, you know, in the midst of this somber situation, which we don't know where it's even going to go by then. Uh, so that's that's one thing that, you know, that I've been thinking of is, you know, here you are thinking about, you know, Miles Garrett talking about, hey, I'm going to go out. We want to go out there and uh, play the spoilers for the Steelers. And then you've got the intensity of the Pittsburgh Steelers and how they really need this victory to, to try to keep their playoff hopes alive and, you know, just Kenny Pickett coming off of back-to-back game-winning drives and that just sensational, stunning game-winning drive that he had over the Ravens uh, and just, you know, how much they really need this game. I mean, as Kevin Stefanski put it yesterday, the Browns are actually playing in something other than a completely meaningless game. They have a chance to impact, you know, the playoffs and they have a chance to, um, you know, impact the outcome of what happens with the Steelers. So, um it's just going to be interesting to see how everyone is able to do what they have to do to go out and do their jobs in the midst of, you know, one of the worst tragedies potentially that I ever remember in the NFL. Ashley, I've always been impressed by the way athletes can compartmentalize. Um, I, I mean, we've, we see it, you know, we see, see players get hurt um, like serious injuries, obviously nothing to the level of, of what we saw last night. Um, but we see serious injuries and then players turn around and they play the game. And I'm always amazed by how they're able to compartmentalize. But like I said, we haven't seen anything like we saw last night. So that's going to be a a challenge for players across the league to go out there on, on Sunday and and play. Yeah. I mean, kind of like what Mary Kay said, like, I just have the feeling already it's only Tuesday. The Browns didn't have any kind of media availability today, but I know like Mike Tomlin talked to the Pittsburgh reporters today. Right. And he, he talked about this. He, he, you know, referenced it in his press conference. I do think like, I I wonder if this is just going to kind of take over the whole week. And I think it, it probably should. Right. I mean, for even, even for teams that are playing for something, whether it's seating, whether it's still fighting to make the playoffs, like this I, I think you just felt it reverberate throughout the league. Like, Dan, you talked about the reaction in that. Like, yes, I think players on some level are going to be able to compartmentalize and, like, go out there and play. But, I, I mean, I think even these guys who weren't on the Bengals or the Bills, like, this is, again, like, I think just such a stunning injury to have happened, um, a medical incident, I should say, that it's it's hard to not, like, or to see a world where, on Thursday, we're just straight up talking about the Brown Steelers matchup, right? Like it doesn't feel like to me right now on Tuesday at three forty-seven that that's going to happen. 
yeah, I, I don't know that this is one of those weeks where you're just going to stand there and ask, you know, somebody how they're going to deal with TJ Watt, you know, on, on, on Sunday. Um, that's, that's part of it. I, I mean, I guess we'll see sort of where, where we are by then. Um, hopefully there, there will have been some good news um, at, at that point uh, before then. So um, yeah, is, is there, go ahead, Mary Kay. You know, I was just going to say, um, Dan and Ashley, that, you know, there's another uh, situation that has arisen from this. Tonight, the Pro Football Hall of Fame was going to be announcing the 15 finalists, the 15 modern era finalists. And it's a big deal for Cleveland Browns and for Cleveland Browns fans because Joe Thomas is is going to be one of them. I mean, you know, I, I can honestly say that, you know, he is, he's going to make it. I mean, he's going to be one of the 15 uh, finalists that we deliberate on uh, when we get together uh, as, as a group of hall of fame selectors and decide who's going into the hall of fame this year. And so this was supposed to be, you know, a really big day uh, for Joe, for Browns fans, for the Cleveland Browns. And they have delayed that out of respect for DeMar Hamlin. Um, So as of right now, they're planning on doing that tomorrow night at 8 p.m. It will be announced on NFL Network. And again, this is not who's going into the Hall of Fame, but uh, who will be deliberated on in the Hall of Fame selection meeting. And again, it's 15 modern era uh, semifinalists. And um, and then, you know, then beyond that, then you've got some, you know, coaches and uh, personnel people, too, that that we vote on. But, um, but so that has been postponed for a day. And I think that's the right decision too. I think everybody, when I look at this, I think everyone's handling things really the right way, right? I mean, nobody's saying anything about a game happening anytime soon uh, between the Bills and the Bengals. Uh, I think the Pro Football Hall of Fame and NFL Network did that. I mean, it's not a night to celebrate. I was trying to like, I was trying to figure out what are they going to do with this? And as just as I was thinking about that, I got the email from the Hall of Fame saying they were postponing it. And that happened a few hours ago and I tweeted it. But um, but I think everyone right now is handling it the right way. And I will say that um, that in, in times like this, it's very difficult to speak about these situations. It, it's difficult to cover these situations. And I really commend all the people like Susie Colbert and and, uh, you know, Adam Schefter and, and anyone that had to go live. I mean, uh, you know, our own Bengals writers, we have three Cleveland.com Bengals writers that are covering this right now and have been up till all hours of the night doing the best they can to bring uh, the latest information to everyone. Uh, but I just think uh, in times like these, we have to be supportive of each other uh, as professionals and we have to uh, really work hard to lift each other up and understand how difficult of a job this is and, and not do some of the other stuff that we've seen. Yeah. I mean, the, the nice thing about this is we can hit stop, right? When, when we're done, we, we can just hit stop uh, you yeah. know, to be in this situation that a lot of those people were in. I know um, Ryan Clark has, has been getting a lot of praise for how he handled things, Scott Van Pelt. And then of course the people who were there um, on site, Joe Buck, Troy Aikman, uh, Lisa Salters, <laughs> Um, just, just all that whole crew did, did a really nice job of, of covering the event and not speculating, you know, making sure the information they were getting out there was correct. Um, it's that, that's not always the case. And I, I think a lot of it just comes down to Ashley, like you said, just remembering these people are human beings. Yeah. Like, you know, we, we cover them as football players, but they are also human beings. And when you kind of start at that point, you know, it's, it's something that you can talk about. Yeah, and I think that's why in particular, and I, I tweeted about Ryan Clark last night, like just the fact that they had somebody who could talk so well from a player's perspective, I think was key that they, they got him on there as soon as they could um, because he's somebody who, who understands what this is like, right? And, and he talked about this. He talked about being in the hospital for one of his injuries and teammates coming and, and what that was like for him. Like I thought that was really, really valuable coverage. And yeah, like it's, that was really hard to do because like we've been talking about, like this is so unprecedented. So, I mean, they're figuring out things the same time as everybody else in a situation like that. Right. And you have to stay on air and not speculate and be responsible. And I thought that crew handled it really well. I thought Ryan Clark handled it really well. And like you said, him and Lisa Salter is especially just stuck, stuck, 
out to me in terms of like being honest and like showing emotion and not speculating. So really good job to all those people who, who had to deal with that last night. Okay, I think that'll do it for um, for this segment. Uh, obviously, not not a lot of football talk. It's a little weird talking football now. If you do want some football talk, um, I am going to uh, be joined by Lance Reisland, and he's going to look back at the Commanders game uh, after we take a break here on the Orange and Brown Talk podcast. NIL Now, a podcast dedicated to the name, image, and likeness of today's college and high school athletes. NIL is not a cherry on top. It needs to be thought about as a part of these young men and women's future as a nest egg for something when something goes wrong. You know, there's less than 1% of these football players make it to the NFL. You know, their plan B is sometimes not as lofty as plan A. This NIL thing, when you when you ask what's the next important thing, is to make sure that These players are coming to school for education, sports, but also NIL is a close third in that. It's an investment into these players now that they can take advantage of or leverage their name, image, and likeness to, you know, further their careers. So now you have a nest egg after you've invested so much time into your skill set in college. You should be able to leave college with something. This is NIL Now. And welcome back to the Orange Brown Talk podcast. Now we'll turn our attention to on the field and Lance Reisland joins us to look back on the Browns 24 to 10 win over the Commanders. Lance, let's start with that second half. Uh, so at halftime, I'm looking at the passing game. I'm looking at where things are and, and I'm just wondering to myself, what are we going to be saying if this continues, if Deshaun Watson continues to look like this? And then he comes out in the second half and once again, starts to look more like Deshaun Watson. What what do you think changed in that second half? Well, I'm starting to see the uh, the connection uh, with their run game and their pass game. And that connection for me is he's seeing it. He's seeing that he's processing the information that he's seeing. Uh, his footwork is getting very good in the pocket. Uh, you can tell he's not antsy. A lot of that has to do with, in my opinion, of his ability to process what he's seeing. Uh, and it's getting clearer and clearer. And I thought in the second half, not only he played well, but I thought the defense played well. Um, I thought the special teams, I thought uh, Bjorkas did a nice job. The punter did a great job in terms of flipping the field, uh, making them have long um, long fields to go to try to score. Uh, but for Watson, I just think everything is kind of the rust is coming off, per se, and he's just able to process the information he's seeing, um, which is kind of correlating with his footwork being better and better. So I, I'm going to spring this on you. Deshaun Watson answered this question after the game. Did you have a favorite throw? Was there a throw that he made in that second half that I'm, I'm thinking of two candidates, the one that he said, and, and then there was another one. I'm curious if you have one that stood out to you. Well, I like the, the well, the first one I like was the out route, just because I, I those, those, ha- those out routes, the Cooper for the touchdown are fantastic in terms of timing. So that tells me um, the depth of those is unimportant to me, but the timing is important. So especially off play action, when you're getting, um, you know, when you get three different drops and three and five step drops and off play action, his timing on those out routes is getting good. I like the, uh, the second touchdown pass to Cooper again was processing for me. So I really like that throw in terms of he was able to see that they were in cover three. DPJ was going to clear that out, which tells me he's understanding the coverage and he just had to wait for Cooper. So where the throw wasn't um, out, you know, wasn't awe inspiring in terms of like, wow, uh, the read and the footwork and knowing where it was going with the ball. I really liked on that second touchdown pass to Cooper because it told me he's seeing he's understanding what he's seeing. Okay, so my favorite throw and you would love the angle that we had in Washington. They have their press box in a weird place. Uh, Most of them are kind of to the they're, most of them are on the sideline. If, they, if they're not on the sideline, they kind of veer just a little bit around the corner. Washington's is almost completely in the end zone. So it's like that all 22 view uh, mm-hmm. from, from the end zone. And the David Njoku throw, I think it was David's only catch. That was a really great throw. And then the one that Watson pointed out was the touchdown to Donovan Peoples-Jones. And I think it was sort of similar to why you the throws that you picked out. He just liked how they both read that play that Donovan and him were on the same page. They both read the defense the same and it ended up leading to a catch, uh, a catch and run for a touchdown. Well, the, the touchdown, the pass to uh, people's Jones was really, really good. You had like a, a, a double post in a rail route by the tailback. So he had cleared all that out. Uh, I'm assuming he was going one to two on the post routes. And I would, I would say that Donovan people Jones was down his list three or four. 
So that was pr- that was probably one of his favorite throws, just because he had to go through that whole uh, progression to get to DPJ. The um, shot that Njoku was fantastic. It was a whole shot versus an inverted cover two. Um, really, really, the timing was incredible. Uh, I think it even shocked Njoku. So, yeah, that was a great throw, too, just in terms of he understood the coverage. Um, and I think he understood it even more than – even though I think uh, Njoku and I think all those receivers do a good job of seeing coverage – I even think it shocked him when he got up. He kind of had that look like, wow. And you could see on the, when we were watching the game that he had like, he knew that Watson saw what they were trying to do in coverage. And there was a very small window to get that in there and cover two. And he did a great job. Yeah. Great. So those are, those are four throws right there that were fantastic. Uh, the, the one other thing I want to bring up before we move on uh, from Watson is so the DPJ touchdown came immediately after the DPJ drop. Just the coach in you, when when you hear a quarterback kind of, well, not just hear a quarterback talk about it after the game, but he shows it in action that, you know, hey, you know, you might have made a mistake, but I'm going to come back to you and I'm going to believe in you. When you kind of see that and hear that, what goes through your mind? Well, it tells me they're both practicing really hard. So having a drop, you know, you have a bad throw, you have a drop. Uh, not a big deal, but it tells me, you know, especially from my time out of camp, DPJ is a really hard worker, and Watson was a really hard worker. There was there was a lot of uh, um, connection between those two, and just the work they put in. So it kind of just tells me it was a mistake, no big deal. Next throw, um, I think they have confidence in each other, but I think that confidence comes from the work they put in. You have to believe that the guy who's you know you're throwing the ball to or you're getting the ball from is working as hard as you are, and I think both those guys are on the same page with that. Okay, let's move on to the turnovers. Uh, The Browns intercepted Carson Wentz three times. Denzel Ward had one on the very first series of the game. Grant Delpit took advantage of some really head-scratching Carson Wentz throws. And the, the thing you said to me in your text was the importance of getting turnovers allows you not to have to play a perfect game. And this defense struggled to force turnovers early in the year. Now they've really been forcing them in, in bunches. Well, the first thing it does, it gives you a short field. So you have two things that don't come into account because everybody always talks about points off turnovers, which are very important. But the Browns didn't get a ton of points off their turnovers. What they got was momentum and they got field chain, uh, field, the field was flipped. Um, and it, it allows you not to have to play a perfect game. So you, you don't have to make all the perfect throws. You don't have to be perfect on third down. You don't have to be perfect on your play action. You don't have to be perfect in the red zone because you're going to get more opportunities. When you get, when you have turnovers, you just get more opportunities. And you saw the momentum. You saw the the amount of like energy the defense had. That energy carried over to the uh, the offense. It allows, for some reason, when you get turnovers, it uh, the momentum allows all three phases to play really well together. Um, and you, and when you're turning the ball over, it just kind of all that hard work they're putting in. It, it reassures them that they're doing the right stuff and the confidence. And you can see, I don't care what anybody tells me, momentum and confidence go a long way. Uh, even at the NFL level. And it's, you could see, even though they didn't get a ton of points off those turnovers, they had a uh, kind of a swag to them that they were going to get the job done and they were going to play at a high level. And that carried over to the offense for sure. Now I mentioned Delpit. He was obviously the the guy that came up with two of those turnovers and we've seen him really turn things around this season, Uh, you know, early in the year, there was a lot of finger pointing his way in, in some of those blown coverages, you know, whether it was right or not. And he was really struggling early in the year. But what we're seeing here towards the end of the year has been very encouraging. What well, two things I really like. First of all, you want to give him a lot of credit because obviously he's studying film. He's doing the things that a pro needs to do in terms of what are the tendencies that the offense is giving him. Uh, I think they're also putting him in a very good situation. I think Woods is putting him in a very good situation of not setting him up for failure. And by doing that, I think that he's playing deep. Um, so he's going to give up some underneath throws. Um, I also think they're not putting him in a ton of man coverage, especially man coverage with guys who can beat him, whether they're tight ends or slot receivers. Uh, and the thing I really like about him is they're playing to his strengths and they're getting into him down by the line of scrimmage. And when he's down by the line of scrimmage, he's a playmaker. He is he has gone from a guy who is a liability to a guy who they just have to make sure that he stays within his role and continues to work on uh, keeping the ball in front because he's a great tackler. Uh, understanding that maybe he'll give up a, a pass underneath occasionally, uh, but not to give up the big play. Uh, but I think they're finding a great role. I think it's a credit to him. I think it's a credit to Woods and the defensive staff. Uh, but he's definitely found a role. In these last four games, 
Uh, I love when he creeps down the line of scrimmage because he's going to make a play. And he it, turnovers, he's a um, he's a playmaker. So he's going to cause fumbles. He's got that Tyron Matthew kind of uh, vibe to him where he's going to kind of cause chaos. And uh, I think they I think they've done a really good job. He and the staff have done a good job of uh, with his improvement. Sunday was a very much a what what took so long game for me on the defensive side of the ball. We're going to get into that 21 play drive here in a second, but just generally speaking. So they come out and they start the game with John Johnson, DeAnthony Bell and Grant Delpit all on the field together. Um, so those are your three safeties. You know, in other cases, it, it could have been Ronnie Harrison, um, but they, they went with DeAnthony Bell in this one. And Delpit was playing a little bit of slot. Uh, like he was playing in the box, seemed to be playing to his strengths. Another one, another thing, Miles Garrett. Uh, he stood up on one of his sacks, and this wasn't the only time he did it. They played him standing up over center, and he absolutely blew through to to get one of his sacks in that formation. I guess I just kind of look back on some of that stuff, and I wonder, like, why did it take until week 17 to really start to see this stuff? Well, I give them credit. I kind of go the opposite route with it, Dan. I like the idea that they're trying new things. And, you know, when the definition of insanity is doing the same thing over and over. And a lot of times, you know, you get miles out. They leave miles out that that Y5 technique to the weak side and just have him rush. So, you know, they did some really cool things with bringing him front side A, and they would uh, swoop um, Clowney to the opposite A gap coming around there. So they did some really cool things. I, you know, the secondary stuff, uh, you know, maybe saying, hey, let's get Delpit down the box more. That's where he's really creative. Um, you know, who knows how they're practicing. Maybe those guys have earned some time in practice. Um, I just think they've done a good job of kind of everybody finding their role and kind of starring in their role. And with Miles, it gives him the ability to do some different things. And it creates a lot of work for an offensive coordinator trying to find trying to find him because we've said before he's a game wrecker. So now they're, they did a number of times where they lined him up at the end, but they had Clowney inside of him at the three technique, or he was at the three technique and Clowney's outside. And they did some interesting things. And I think it's, uh, they're healthy. Um, I think they're trying new things and they're not staying status quo. And I like that out of a coach. I like when you're struggling and you try new things and that's what they're doing. They're trying new things. So it wasn't all good. The uh, 21 play, 96 yard drive at the end of the first half. Uh, what do you? What did you see on that drive? What do you think the the issue was there? Well, I, I broke down every play, and they didn't have a run over 12 yards. And most of the runs were four and five, and zero, and three, and three, and nine. So what it tells me, it goes back to what we've talked about now for five months together, is that inability to stop the run inside and even though those guys played better and they are playing better, they're getting moved and they're getting moved because they're not heavy enough. They're getting moved because the linebackers aren't heavy enough and their style of defensive tackle uh, is allowing them to get moved, especially on double teams. So there's a couple of times they played it well um, and it was second seven, but then you got to like, they were so manageable in their third downs that the Redskins were, you know, the Redskins were third and one, uh, they were third and two, they were third and five, and they were third and four on that drive. So that's such a great uh, play calling opportunity for an offense coordinator. You have run or pass. So they're not getting in these down a distance where they can get to their strength, which is rushing the passer and get in those gaps and go, which is the, not only the strengths of their D tackles, but with their ends. So when the Browns get to like third and four, that's what it showed me, that they really struggle in that, that down a distance where the other team can do either or. Um, they're very really good when you have to pass. If they can, if they can get them off schedule and get them behind the six a little bit, they can be a little bit more successful. On that drive, that was the, um, you know, the old wing tee where it was, you know, second six, third and four, run the ball, get it, and move on. And they didn't do much more than that. But it just kind of showed the uh, the liability inside against the run, um, which is something we've talked about for weeks. Now, the, the positive out of that and I thought this was really important, is when they came out of the locker room, there, there was a scenario where, you know, Washington could have come out and, you know, they, I believe coming into the game, they led the league in time of possession, average time of possession. And I'm sure that's still the case after Sunday's game. There was a world where they could have come out of the locker room and held the ball for another six, seven, eight minutes and double dipped and, and really put the Browns in a hole. But instead the Browns forced a three and out. So, even though that 21 play drive certainly exposed some flaws, I, I thought it was really impressive that they responded coming out of the locker room. 
Well, goes to show you they're playing with a lot of intensity too. Because the the twenty one play drive that wasn't a lack of everybody. I thought everybody was lined up for the most part. They had a pretty good gap integrity. There weren't any blown coverages. There weren't any uh, blown holes where that you know, like we talked about before. You know, gap integrity. Not having your gap is like blowing a coverage in this, uh, for a defensive lineman. They had they were there. They were doing the right things. They were just. Um, not as good as they needed to be. They were just getting moved because they of the style they play, but their effort was there. They seemed to be lining up right. Uh, they seemed to be doing what they're coached in terms of lining up, uh, taking the gap they're supposed to, angling, slanting. They did a lot of movement, a lot of different stuff to try to help those defensive tackles, which tells you they're practicing, which tells you they're watching film, which tells you they're paying attention to detail. So, yeah, I agree that three and out was huge um, because they had just been – and it wasn't really, um, you know, it wasn't like the 12 and 9. It was just like they just couldn't get off the field. Um, just, for me, it just kind of showed, you know, getting to – if they're third and five or under, the Browns struggle. And they have all year in that range because teams can just – they can run or pass. All right, that is Lance Reisland breaking down the Browns' win over the Commanders. Uh, Lance, we'll have you on to do this one more time uh, next week, of course. And don't worry. Lance isn't going anywhere. We're going to find a spot for him on this podcast. If someone tweeted at us, uh, they learn something new every time Lance is on the pod. And I, I agree. I learned something new every time you're on the pod too, Lance. So uh, we will certainly continue to find a role for you here on the Orange or Brown Talk podcast. Um, real quick, I just want to remind everyone, I mentioned it uh, in the first segment of the show. I'm going to include a link uh, in the description of the show if you want to go make a donation to DeMar Hamlin's uh, Toy Drive Fund, which... I believe is up over $4 million now. So for Mary Kay, Ashley, and Lance, I'm Dan. Thanks for listening, everybody.